Welcome back to this next session. This is a special session because we have among us one of the very few people, maybe four or five people in the world who started working first on polymeric nanomaterials in the 70s, if I remember right, together with Professor Speiser at ETH, not far from here. And it's a small group of people who had this uh, wide perspective, this long horizon on working on a field which did not perfectly work then but now it's uh, being to come to fruition, and we are very honored to have Patrick Kubra from Paris here talking about squalane-based nanoparticles for the uh, treatment of diseases. Now, it's not only on cancer where his nanomaterials are, are applied, so his uh, horizon will be broader than the original title indicated. Welcome to the seat today. So thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, thank you also to uh, Beat uh, for, uh, do you hear me? It's okay. For uh, uh, allowing me to deliver this talk on uh, squalene-based nanoparticles, oh, sorry, on squalene-based nanoparticles for the treatment this time of neurological uh, disorders. Well, you know that uh, uh, the encapsulation in the uh, current nanocarriers, including liposomes, nanoparticles, polymeric micelles, results from a physical encapsulation process, which can be absorption, entrapment, uh, encapsulation, etc., etc. And this results in, in general in a poor drug uh, uh, loading and a rapid uncontrolled burst release. So the idea uh, we had was to move from the physical to the chemical encapsulation paradigm. And the idea is to use to do that to use a squalene, because you know squalene is a natural and biocompatible uh, lipid. And uh, this lipid has a unique property to adopt a molecular folded conformation, as you can see here, into water. And we have taken advantage of this compact molecular conformation, as you can see here, to link a drug with a squalene through a bioclevable uh, linker. And if you are putting this bioconjugate into water, they will spontaneously self-assemble as nanoparticles, as you can see here, uh, with a size of around 100 nanometers, and a supramolecular organization. And this results, in fact, in a higher drug loading because you have a chemical link, also in an absence of burst release, again because of the chemical link. And if you are a good chemist, you can design the bioclevable link so that the drug will be released exactly in the target cells or in the uh, target tissues. So this platform, I would say the so-called squalinolation platform, has been applied to a lot of uh, molecules, including small anti-cancer drugs. For instance, uh, with uh, doxorubicin, you can uh, reach a drug loading uh, of around uh, 60%, also with uh, gemcitabine, cisplatin. But you can also uh, link squalene with either antibiotics or antiviral compounds to treat intracellular uh, resistant infectious disease, you get also nanoparticles. Even you can link the small lipidic squalene molecule with a long high molecular weight hydrophilic small interfering RNA. And in that case, even you get nanoparticles after putting the, those bioconjugates into water. And there are also some applications in the field of the neuroscience, and I will concentrate on that uh, today. The first application is uh, very recent. It is the pain alleviation. You know, of course, uh, uh, very well that the opioid and especially the morphinic treatments are resulting in severe side effects, including pulmonary depression, opioid addiction, and opioid tolerance. And actually, uh, uh, as you know, the misuse and the addiction to opioids is really a represent really a national crisis in USA, with uh, 11 million of patients addicted to opioids, and around 200 uh, deaths per day, which is more than the traffic accidents. And in fact, uh, 
as you know, the encephalin, which are endogenous neuropeptides, not passing through the blood-brain barrier, are uh, 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 very attractive. It is a very attractive option, but which doesn't result into uh, addiction tolerance, etc., etc. But the encephalin are very rapidly metabolized after intravenous in, uh, administration. The half-life is only a few minutes. So the idea was to link squalene with uh, uh, le encephalin, as you can see here, and to make the synthesis of a small uh, library of le encephalin squalene bioconjugate. And you can perform the conjugation either at the C-terminal moiety or at the N-terminal amine of the uh, peptides using either a deoxycarbonyl linker, a diglycolic linker, or an amide linker, and so you can control the speed of the release of the uh, peptides. If you, again, if you are putting those uh, bioconjugates, le encephalin uh, bioconjugates, into water, you can see that you will get immediately uh, spherical nanoparticles with a size in between 70 or 120 nanometers, depending on the uh, uh, bioconjugate and the link. And you can see that it is possible to design either positively charged nanoparticles if the linkage is performed at the C-terminal link of the peptide or negatively charged nanoparticles if the uh, linkage is uh, realized at the N-terminal uh, amine. And the drug loading, as you can see here, is very high in between 50 and 60%. Now, what is interesting, if you are incubating those uh, le encephalin squalene nanoparticles in a cell culture medium containing only 10% serum, you can see that you will have a progressive uh, activation of the prodrug, disappearance of the prodrug, and the release, as you can see here, of the peptide, which will be slowly degraded because you are in a seric medium, except for the amide function for which, in those in vitro condition, you can see that the prodrug is quite stable. Then uh, we tested uh, those uh, uh, nanoparticles for the pharmacological activity on the inflammatory pain. And uh, the model is that first you have to inject Caraginan, as you can see here, in the right pole. And after three hours, you can see that you have an inflamed pole associated with an inflammatory pain. And after that, you can start with a treatment, either with the le encephalin squalene nanoparticles or the le encephalin free, or the, uh, some antagonist that we have used. And we are using the Argrief test that you can see here. It's a hot plate and you will measure the PAU withdrawal latency, higher, longer it is, more uh, analgesic is your uh, uh, treatment. What are the results? First of all, look what happened with morphine. You can see that after intravenous injection of morphine, of morphine at the general uh, dosage, you have a huge increase in the power withdrawal latency, which corresponds, of course, to a, a very strong analgesic effect. Now, you know that naloxone is an antagonist of morphine. If you are pre-treating the animals with naloxone before morphine, you can see here in red that you will completely abolish the uh, uh, anti-nociceptive effects of morphine. Now, what is very interesting, if you are using naloxone methiodides, which doesn't uh, pass through the blood-brain barrier, in that case, you can see that in green here, you don't abolish the analgesic effect of morphine. And this is the clear demonstration, but this was, of course, well known, that the morphine is working by a central uh, analgesic pharmacological activity, and this explains, of course, the tolerance and the addiction. What happened now, as you can see here, with the squalene leoncephalid nanoparticles using a diglycolic linker? Again, you can see very clearly that after intravenous injection, you get a very strong uh, anti-hyperalgesic uh, effect, 
And what is very interesting is that in uh, green, if you are pre-treating the animals, as you can see here, with the uh, naloxone methiodite, you completely abolish the uh, antinociceptive effect of the Le encephaline nanoparticles. And this is a clear demonstration that the pain alleviation occurs with those nanoparticles, not through a central analgesic effect, but through a peripheral pharmacological effect. And of course, the Le encephaline peptide 3, as you can see here in black, has absolutely no uh, uh, analgesic uh, effect. Now, the same was observed with the other uh, uh, bioconjugates, with the other uh, Le encephaline squalene nanoparticles using an amide linker or using a deoxycarbonyl uh, linker. You can see that always you have a very uh, strong pain alleviation effect, and this effect is completely in green, abolished when you are pre-treating the animals with the uh, naloxone methiodite, which doesn't uh, pass through the blood-brain barrier, demonstrating once again that the pain alleviation occurred through a, peripheric, a peripheral pharmacological uh, activity, which is, of course, is very important. And you can see here that the area under the curve is equivalent and sometimes higher than in the case of morphine. Then afterwards, we uh, did uh, a biodistribution study, and we looked especially what happens at the level of the inflamed pow after administration of those Le encephaline squalene nanoparticles fluorescently labeled. And you can see very clearly that those nanoparticles concentrated into the inflamed pow. You have here a higher magnification of that. And this is not the case, as you can see here, at the level of the Hilti contralateral pow. So you can see that very clearly the Le encephaline squalene nanoparticles gain access to the peripheral inflamed tissue. And then we performed an overall uh, biodistribution looking to the other organs, and it was very interesting to note that in fact, as you can see here, the brain, you have absolutely no passage of those nanoparticles uh, through the blood-brain barrier or the peptide through the blood-brain barrier. There is absolutely nothing at the level of the brain. So the conclusion of this is that, uh, in fact, the Le encephaline squalene nanoparticles were able to induce a very strong anti-hyperalgesic effect, which was lasting longer than morphine, with a higher or a similar, depending on the bioconjugate area under the curve, than morphine. And naloxone methiodite pretreatment, as I told you, abolished the anti-hyperalgesic effect of Le encephaline squalene nanoparticles. And this is a demonstration that they were uh, uh, pharmacologically active at the level of the opioid receptor located peripherally. And this explains that you don't have, of course, tolerance and or addiction. The second example I would like to show you is concerning the brain ischemia and the uh, stroke. Here we have applied uh, this qualenoylation concept to adenosine. Why? Because adenosine has an important role in energetic metabolism. It is a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator. And normally, this molecule should have a very strong pharmacological activity in different, in several neurological disorders. But in fact, it is not the case because, as you know, adenosine is very rapidly metabolized after intravenous administration. The half-life is only 10 seconds, which is, of course, very, very fast. And this molecule is uh, too hydrophilic to cross the blood-brain barrier, so adenosine doesn't pass through the blood-brain barrier. So the idea, again, was to link squalene at the level of the amino group of adenosine to stabilize, to protect the amino group from the deamination because the metabolization of adenosine occurs through the deamination process, and also to make the molecule more lipophilic to allow it to pass through the blood-brain barrier. 
And after putting the adenosine squalene bioconjugate into water, they are forming, they are self-assembling as nanoparticles, and by X-ray diffraction, you can look that uh, the organization is a sponge-like structure. So we applied that to the uh, spinal cord injury, but I have no time to speak about that today. And I will show you what was done uh, uh, concerning the brain uh, ischemia. This is a collaboration with Turkari Dalkara at HGTP University. And in fact, the model is quite classical. Eh? You are putting a filament into the carotid. And then, as you can see here and here, you are inducing an ischemic zone. And you can measure, of course, the volume of the ischemic uh, infarct. And you can see that after treatment with adenosine as a free drug, you have no decrease of the infarct volume comparatively to the placebo-treated animals. What is very interesting, after administration of the adenosine squalene nanoparticles at a dose of 7.5 mg per kilo body weight or 15 mg per kilo body weight pre-ischemia uh, or 15 mg per kilo body weight post-ischemia during the reperfusion or after, as you can see here, 24 hours permanent occlusion, you can see that each time here, you have a very strong decrease of the ischemic area. And this was translated in an amelioration, improvement of the neurologic deficit score, as you can see here uh, very clearly. So our hypothesis was that, uh, in fact, uh, because the drug was more lipophilic due to the squalene, we passed through the blood-brain barrier, and we protected adenosine from the uh, metabolization. But one reviewer of the paper told us, OK, please demonstrate that your nanoparticles are passing through the blood-brain barrier. And to do that, uh, uh, we, to do that, in fact, we uh, labeled uh, the nanoparticles with, adeno with uh, tritium at the adenosine part of the bioconjugate and carbon-14 at the squalene part. So it's a double uh, radio label, uh, labeling. And then we injected those nanoparticles uh, uh, intravenously. We did a whole biodistribution study. And we looked, we concentrate, of course, at the level of the brain. And you can see uh, uh, very clearly that very uh, amazingly, there was absolutely no carbon-14 uh, able to pass through the blood-brain barrier. In red here, a little bit tritium, but after analysis by uh, radio HPLC, we observed that there was absolutely no adenosine into the brain. So the conclusion was that unexpectedly, neither the nanoparticles nor the adenosine squalene as single molecules, nor the adenosine released from the nanoparticles were found into the brain parenchyma. So how to explain that? We did uh, a, a PICA pharmacokinetic study, and you can see here that we observed that after intravenous administration of the adenosine squalene nanoparticles, we had long circulating properties. And the adenosine squalene nanoparticles represented really a sort of reservoir of adenosine into the bloodstream. And in so we investigated the blood compartments. And you know that adenosine has different receptors, including the A2A and E2B receptors at the endothelium wall, especially at the level of the, uh, uh, of the brain capillaries. So we looked, we did some biopsies of the animals, we looked to the brain capillaries, and you can see that for the untreated animals, you had a, a, a lot of ischemic capillaries which are blocked by clocked erythrocytes and platelets. And this explains you, and this is a case also in the clinic, that the reperfusion was completely inefficient. And uh, you can see that after treatment with the adenosine squalene nanoparticles, you uh, decreased quantitatively the number of ischemic capillaries with uh, 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 clocked erythrocytes. And so the conclusion is that, in fact, the adenosine squalene nanoparticles were able to improve the microcirculation reflow, 
due to capillaries relaxation, which was induced by the interaction of the released adenosine with A2A and E2B receptor at the level of the endothelial cells, and that the pharmacological activity in the stroke resulted rather from a peripheral and not at all from a central mechanism of action. So the last question was how to explain those long circulating uh, uh, properties. Because the nanoparticles are non-pegylated and they have no ligands. You have to remember here that the squalene, in fact, in the mammalians and the humans is a precursor of the uh, cholesterol biosynthesis. And you know that the biosynthesis after uh, in the blood are transported either by the LDL or the HDL. And so we did the hypothesis that because of this qualinolation, the bioconjugate will enter into the core of the LDL and have the long circulating properties. And to uh, investigate that, we incubated first squalene gemcitabine with human blood. And then we looked to the biodistribution, as you can see here, of the uh, uh, radioactivity. And you can see that a significant amount of the uh, gemcitabine uh, squalene bioconjugate was uh, found, in fact, in the LDL fraction. And in the humans, LDL is a major transporter of cholesterol. Then we did in vivo experiments with rodents, of course, not uh, with, uh, with humans. And you have to know that in rodents, the transporter of the cholesterol is not LDL, but HDL because the level of LDL into the uh, rodents is very, uh, 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 very low. And we investigated that after intravenous administration for squalene adenosine, I come back to that, squalene gemcitabine, and other squalene oilated prodrugs, and you have the results here. You can see that, in fact, we look to the biodistribution in between VLDL, LDL, HDL, the no and the non-lipoproteic fraction. And you can see very clearly in orange that the adenosine squalene concentrated into the uh, HDL. And if you are looking in blue to the biodistribution of the cholesterol, you can see a perfect superimposition in between uh, the cholesterol distribution and the adenosine squalene or the gemcitabine squalene biodistribution into the blood. And then what we did, uh, in fact, is just an in vitro experiment in which we co-incubated, as you can see here, the nanoparticles with a size of around 100 nanometers. Those are the big particles with the LDL, which are only 20 nanometer size particles. And you can see that those LDL will absorb very fast at the surface of the nanoparticles and will induce the disaggregation of the nanoparticles, and this will allow to the uh, prodrug, the squalinolated uh, released prodrug, to insert, as we showed by molecular modeling, into the uh, LDL. And so the, the, the conclusion is that the single linkage of squalene to a drug allows to use LDL as endogenous indirect nanocarrier, which results because LDL are long circulating nanoparticles in long circulating properties without using uh, pegylation or other uh, uh, decoration at the surface of the nanoparticles. So I come now to the uh, uh, some message uh, to show you that sometimes you have to think out of the box. The first is that it is now very interesting to use chemistry instead of physics to encapsulate drugs into nanocarriers in order to uh, have a better controlled drug delivery if you, can, if you can design a link which is able to be hydrolyzed at the level of the target cells. And this will allow also a higher drug payload because each molecule of the transporter material will be able to transport at least one molecule of the uh, uh, pharmacological uh, agent compound. The second uh, message is that for the treatment of some neurological disorders, the design of nanoparticles decorated with transferrin, ApoE, etc., etc., uh, and able to translocate the BBB is, is sometimes very difficult, very complex, 
and the translocation process is often not very, very efficient. Less than 1% of the injected dose is going into the brain. But sometimes it is not needed to pass through the blood-brain barrier, and it is more interesting to target the peripheral re, uh, uh, receptors because it represents a more safe and easy approach, more safe, uh, especially in the field, for instance, of the pain, and also because nobody knows exactly what uh, PLGA nanoparticles, etc., or polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles, what will happen into the brain in terms of metabolization, elimination, etc., etc. And the last message is that you can use endogenous uh, carriers uh, like LDL as uh, 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 indirect uh, uh, carriers for targeting, especially in the field of the cancer, because you know that a lot of cancer cells are hyper-expressing the LDL receptors to catch a lot of lipids to create membranes, etc., etc. So I would like to, to finish by uh, acknowledging, of course, all the people of uh, my group in Chatney Malabry, especially uh, Joe Feng uh, here, uh, who is a PhD student actually uh, working on pain alleviation, and also Cinda Lepetre, which is an associate professor uh, working uh, uh, with me, and uh, uh, organic chemist. Also, Alice Godin uh, for the stroke story with uh, Karine Andrieux, who was in my group now. She's becoming professor at Paris Fifth University. And also Dunia Sobo, who was a PhD student, and Simona Mura, associate professor for the story of the LDL. And thank you very much to your, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Something we could learn from you at the first place, myself and the young researchers here, is to finish your talks on the second, what you did. <laughs> so uh, that's, you are a great big exception to the, to, the, to the rule. But now let's go to the more it's serious question. Time, eh? yeah. Not the French time. Let's go to the question, yes, up there. Thank you very much. Uh, I wondered how critical is the linker chemistry in your platform? Uh, yes, yes. How, how critical is the linker chemistry? In the, I saw in one case you have um, the, the, um, the, the linker is an amide bond. Yeah. That to me, that's pretty stable. And I wonder, is, is this something that you normally optimize or you just do this based on the, the uh, molecular structure of the, the, the drug? So normally, you know, the uh, uh, link is, of course, very important because this will allow the release of the drug depending on the biological environment. So this is true that with, with the amide bond in vitro, but only with 10% serum, we had no release of the peptide. But you have seen that in vivo, uh, we had the pharmacological activity. So it is possible that at the level of the uh, inflammatory process, of course, you have a completely different environment, probably with uh, much more uh, uh, enzymes, with uh, higher enzymatic activity, and that, well, in those conditions, the peptide is released. But in the field of the cancer, we test a different uh, link, ester, amide, etc., and sometimes it's, it's not working, of course, if the drug is not released. And uh, we had an, uh, a very clear experience with paclitaxel that we linked uh, to squalene by an ester bond. We had very nice nanoparticles, but without any anti-cancer activity. And this was due, in fact, uh, uh, this was due to the fact that really those nanoparticles were very, very hyd hydrophobic because of the paclitaxel and because of the squalene. And the enzymes are unable to penetrate and to make the hydrolysis of the ester bond. So the management of the link is, of course, very important. Now we have a question from uh, Pascal Messer from the Swiss Tropical Institute. <laughs> Thanks. I have a question about uh, IP. Where are you? <laughs> I mean, ah, okay. <laughs> uh, is, the, is the idea of squalinoylation squalino uh, protected by patents, or can I just go ahead and add squalene to whatever drug I, I like? No, no, it's protected mm -hmm. by a lot of patents because mm -hmm. uh, we, we have patents for different drugs, and we just patented uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago the pain. For that reason, mm -hmm. I presented those new results. So if we have other ideas, uh, tropical diseases, yeah, uh, I would contact you? Yeah, Listen. yeah, okay. with Thank pleasure. You.
Moment, Silke. Um, I was wondering, you showed uh, this for, uh, for acute pain. Uh, does it also work in chronic pain? Because in this case, the environment most probably will be perhaps less accessible. We didn't uh, test uh, yet for uh, chronic pain. But we will, it is on the plans, of course. Thank you very much, wonderful. Uh, I'm very interested in the uh, stroke yes. experiment you made, and uh, I noticed that you had to also handle doses in uh, different ways, depending on the timelines for treating the ischemia. Um, I just was wondering whether have you observed um, other effects, um, no. peripheral uh, effects yes, or good, any good question. Un un unexpected or undesirable yeah. effects? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this is a very important question because, as you know, adenosine is playing the game on three different receptors, E1, on four different receptors, E1, E3, E2A, E2B, and normally there can be some cardiac uh, effects because uh, the pharmaceutical industry developed a lot of uh, agonists of adenosine, more stable than adenosine, and then you have side effects for the uh, uh, cardiovascular, in the cardiovascular field. So we tested, we did a whole toxicological study, including uh, that on uh, cardiac effects, on sleep also, because adenosine can play also on sleep, and the typical uh, toxicological uh, study uh, on the different organs by histology and uh, clinical biology, especially the liver, because there are some concentrate, and we didn't observe at this dosage uh, any uh, side effects. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your nice talk. I was wondering, um, what, what were your biggest obstacles when you start moving to GMP and clinical translation? I can tell you one important obstacle was at the level of the synthesis, because we are starting from squalene. But you know squalene, you cannot make the reaction between squalene and the drug, because squalene is just a lipid. So we have to oxidize the squalene and to get the squalenic acid, for instance. And to do that, uh, we are using the old Van Tamelen reaction, which is an old reaction, and we are using chrome oxide in order to get, to pass from the epoxide to the carboxylic uh, moiety to allow the linkage with the drug. And, well, I didn't know, but chrome oxide is not allowed in the pharmaceutical industry, even if you show that in the final product, you don't have any chrome oxide. So this has blocked to us, and we have tested a lot of o oxidants, uh, oxidizing compounds. And the problem is that you have double binds at the level of the squalene, and uh, in general, you are inducing the oxidation of all the double binds, or part of the double bonds. So it's very, de and now just we have find a way, I will not tell you which way, because from a chemical point of view, it was more or less complicated. One way to allow the oxidation uh, of the squalene just at the end of the, of the, of the chain, of the uh, uh, isoprene chain, and allowing to pass from the epoxide to the uh, acidic uh, moiety. But this was one example of the difficulty, you have completely right because uh, a lot of people, especially in the chemistry field, are thinking, okay, I'm, I am making golden nanoparticles, then I will inject and, okay, I will treat cancer. It's much more complicated. Squalene is perfectly uh, a, a perfect non-toxic compound. And even you see, we were blocked during years just because of this chemistry uh, allowing to make the oxidation of the squalene and to couple to a drug. There is another question. Oh, oh. Nice presentation, Patrick. I have one you. question. So how unique is squalene? If you simply replace squalene by another hydrophobic molecule, like cholesterol or a fatty acid, do you, do you then get the same effects? Yeah, uh, we just published a paper uh, by uh, linking cholesterol to uh, gemcitabine. And we have no, uh, in vitro at least, no anti-cancer activity. Uh, but cholesterol is a special case. We had the idea to use cholesterol, but you know to inject cholesterol intravenously to people, I don't know if it is really good. 
so what we did first, because the story is, is uh, a little bit amazing, we started, in fact, uh, trying to encapsulate gemcitabine into polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles. And it was not at all working because the drug was too hydrophilic. So we did, okay, we will do a pro-drug more lipophilic to allow a better encapsulation process. And in fact, we looked to the Eli Lilly patents, who did some pro-drugs of gemcitabine. Uh, they uh, linked gemcitabine to uh, different fatty acids, including stearic acid. And we did the synthesis. Uh, with gemcitabine, but it was impossible to do the encapsulation because it is like a stone. It is absolutely insoluble in water, and you have no nanoparticles. Then we took, okay, we need to have a more uh, condensed molecular uh, aspect of the, of, the, of the lipids, and we took two uh, cholesterol and then two squalene. We did the linkage. And we observed by chance, research is sometimes chance, that chance that those uh, uh, bioconjugates were forming nanoparticles and that we didn't need to have polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles for the encapsulation process. This is a story. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much again for this very interesting presentation. Thank you.